that we seek to repair is our criminal justice system. And while there is still significant room to grow, I think having the first phase legislation to make some inroads with criminal justice reform is important. I think we need to expand upon that in some significant ways in terms of reducing some of the disparities that marginalized communities face, uh, in addition to a number of other practices that have been particularly harmful to the community. Thank you. Mr. Foster. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Name one action or policy President Donald Trump has put into place that you support. Well, it's unfortunate that he got rid of President Obama's uh, Iraq, Iran, I'm sorry, Iranian plan. <clears throat> but I do like the fact that he's tough on Iran and uh, he also got that general, Soleimani. Thank you. Mrs. Garcia, the same question to you. Please name one action or policy President Trump has put into place that you support. <clears throat> well, what can I say? Even a bro broken clock gets it right two times a day. Um, I am a small business owner, and I have gone to China myself to get products produced there. And I know what an issue it is for American entrepreneurs and business owners to... Um, take their intellectual property over to China and actually uh, uh, make products there. And so <clears throat> while I don't agree with probably the reasoning behind uh, the tariffs that he put in place, I do think that we need to, need to be serious about enforcing our intellectual property rights. But I also want to say that this isn't, this is one little small piece. Yes, I can agree uh, that Donald Trump has done something right, but there's a very much bigger issue at place here. Donald Trump, we have a we have a white supremacist in the White House. And thank you we very much, Mrs. Garcia. That's your time. Colonel Harris, the same question to you. I think um, taking out the uh, Soleimani, whenever you have a terrorist or combatant on the battlefield, I know that Congress had an issue with it, but you don't really know how motivated the, our military was when we did that. That guy has been the pain aside for a very long time in taking him out motivated almost every soldier I know. So I, I would definitely agree with that. Thank you very much. Mrs. Hager. You, you know, as a gun violence survivor, um, gun violence is something that's very personal to me. I agree with the sentiments that President Trump has said that he wants universal background checks. Unfortunately, he reverses that position when it seems like he gets a phone call from the NRA. So one of the things I'm looking forward to doing is helping him keep that spine and actually enact universal background checks. It's one in a string of things that I, as a mom of two toddlers and a responsible gun owner that was raised here in Texas, um, would like to see happen so that we can do something about the gun violence epidemic in this state. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Hernandez. Well, very briefly was the um, repeal of the TPP, but we saw how quickly he backtracked on that. Thank you very much. Mr. Osegueda, name one action or policy President Donald Trump and his administration has put into place that you agree with. Yeah, I'm not sure that I've done a deep analysis of all of his proposals. I'm sure there is some element um, that I would agree with. I think the larger aspect is that we're dealing with policy that generally doesn't have a comprehensive view of what the direction is that it wants to accomplish. And we're also saying that Congress is not passing nearly enough legislation to adequately uh, answer that question in terms of something of significance. Thank you. Ms. Sinsun Ramirez. So one of the critical issues that I do agree with Donald Trump on is attacking the opioid crisis for the healthcare crisis that it is in this country. I want to see us go far farther and put more investment into treatment um, and also hold the pharmaceutical companies that have fueled this epidemic in our country. And that's why I think it's important to have someone like me that knows how to tackle legislation and bring voters out and make ordinary people the drivers of change in our government. Thank you. Senator West. When you begin to think about um, federal prison system, some 2.3 million people incarcerated at a cost of about $31,000 per year. The first step back was an act that was in the a step in the right direction, but there's still more to do. We've got to deal with the prison issues, the low-level drug offenses, and we have to make certain that those persons are out of jail and that we invest more in the education where we invest in education right now at about $13,000 per year, 31,000 to house someone in the penitentiary. There's more work to do. The first act was a step in the right direction, but there's still more to do. Thank you. Our next round of questions will be directed to individual candidates. The candidate we address will have 45 seconds to respond. Other candidates can offer 30-second rebuttals as chosen by the moderators. Then we will return to the original candidate for a 30-second closing statement. Our first question is for MJ Hager. 
Ms. Hager, you have earned the endorsement of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, the campaign arm of U.S. Senate Democrats. Some of your fellow uh, opponents in this race call this meddling by Washington, D.C. Ms. Sinzun Ramirez characterized the decision as, quote, tone deaf to the diverse Texas electorate. What's your response to those comments? You know, of all of the endorsements we've received and all the endorsements on everybody in this race, the DSCC endorsement is the only one that only looks at viability. All they care about is flipping the U.S. Senate and getting our government back up and running for working families again. So it was something we were very proud of. It was a nod to the grassroots campaign that we've built. Um, we have over 30,000 unique donors. Our average donation is uh, $22, and we get 90 percent of our donations from under $100, and we've raised $4 million that way against a guy that is not doing anything for Texas families. So uh, polling looks great. The data looks great. The, the tens of thousands of Texans that I've met driving across the state tell me that they're ready and hungry to send somebody to, te to D.C. to deliver a healthy dose of Texas values so that when they look at D.C., they see strength and integrity and servant leadership reflected back. Thank you very much. I saw Mrs. Garcia's hand raised first, and we'll get to Colonel Harris and, and Ms. Susan Ramirez. So, MJ, I want to say that I respect so much your resume and what you have accomplished, but the fact is that you did not beat John Carter, and we are not going to beat John Cornyn by playing politics as usual. Money cannot be the turn determining factor in who wins this race. The fact is that the Texas Democratic Party has not won a U.S. Senate seat since 1986, before my first campaign that I volunteered on. We need to be different. We need to inspire people by being the party of moral clarity and political courage. Thank you very much, Mrs. Garcia. We'll go to you, Colonel Harris. I saw your hand raised next. So um, th that decision was made, what, uh, less than a week after the closing of the application? There's no possible way that they knew or vetted every candidate before they, select, they made their decision. And that's just clearly that those Democrats in D.C. or Democrats in New York and California don't understand Texas Democrats. They're, they select someone who meets their criteria, but their criteria hasn't won in Texas since 86. So only, only Texans know what Texans need. Thank you very much, Colonel Harris. We have time for just one more uh, rebuttal. I'll give it to Ms. Sinzun Ramirez. I, I did invoke you in the question. So. You know, I think many of us admire what MJ did in her district and race in 2018. But when we think about winning statewide and viability in 2020, we need a candidate that can speak to the rich diversity of who the Texas Democratic Party is, that can bring white progressives, African Americans, Asians, and Latinos together. Y quizás una candidata que también hable español. That is what is a candidate, that's the kind of candidate that will win in 2020. And I'm proud that that's what I've done my entire career. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Hager, we'll give you 30 seconds to close on this topic if you wish. Yeah, I think that people who actually really know politics and partisan index and gerrymandering, um, that district was gerrymandered to be much redder than the rest of the state. And John Carter won his last midterm by 32 points. We lost that race by 2.9 and still outperformed all of the statewide candidates, including Beto. So I think actually that that race is a good example of how we are actually going to win this race in 2020. Thank you very much. Senator West, you are an attorney who has served in the state Senate for 27 years. Some call you a career politician. So in a time when the Democratic Party is interested in fresh faces, why should voters elect you? Well, some people may call me a career politician, but I'm an experienced politician. So was L LBJ when he um, put in the uh, issues concerning Medicaid, Medicare and Social Security. Uh, when we had the issues concerning the entitlement programs and Democrats have been very involved in that. Those have been experienced politicians. The fact is we do need someone that can help with young people, help with deals with concerning uh, health care. I have those experiences. Gun sense, I have those, have those experiences. And someone that can bring together the Democratic Party. When you understand that I have the endorsement of the Latino, the largest Latino organization in the state, the Tejano Democrats, the number one person in the Texas Coalition of Black Democrats poll, that shows that persons know the experience that I have will benefit this party. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Garcia. So I respect Senator West's service very much, and I don't question his heart at all. But the reality is that we are all just running for one seat, one single seat in the Senate, one of 100 people. And then if you compound it by the entire government, no one of us can do the things that we all wish that we could do. We need to change the system. We have created a system in which money determines outcomes. The, the biggest metric in this entire thing is how much money people have. We need to come up with a system where 
we can take over and change government altogether. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Hagar. Yeah, I think that in this case, you know, John Cornyn has a lot of experience as well. Uh, and he's been in statewide office here in Texas in, for nearly 40 years and been in the Senate for 18. And I, I would argue that the Texans that I meet across the state don't feel like they, he's done anything for them. So I think that uh, people across Texas are actually looking for fresh faces and voices, people who are not engrossed in the system and have not accepted the good old boys club and politics as usual and actually can go about, you know, the way that I built a broad coalition in D.C. of Democrats and Republicans when I was fighting to make our military stronger. That's what Texans, I think, are looking for. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Well, I heard MJ speak about fresh faces. In 2018, they didn't mention that I ran for lieutenant governor. That's a statewide seat and almost got almost a half a million votes. Uh, my opponent said I exasperated him. So we're looking for fresh faces, and I was that face that made a difference on the outside. Beto O'Rourke uh, gathered uh, 623,000 votes. I gathered 455,000 votes in the same statewide race in 2018. I'm the fresh face they're looking for. Uh, Ms. Edwards. When we take a look back at the 2018 cycle, what we found is that Beto did remarkably well when he galvanized people who are persuadable voters, but they were people who were people of color who had registered in high numbers but didn't come back out to vote in high numbers. And the same held true for those that were 35 years old and younger. We need a candidate that can speak to those populations and build all of those coalitions, the persuadable voters, those 35-year-olds and younger, as well as the communities of color. And when they ask you, why should I believe you that my life will be different, you should say because it has been different for the communities that you've represented. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hernandez, Ms. Buckingham. Yeah. Did you raise your hand? I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, she, he raised his hand, and then she did, and then I did. Oh, we haven't so. heard from you first, but if you would like to, yeah, I'll pass it on to them. Mr. Foster. Yeah, yeah. This is about bold vision and big ideas. Now, I am a rural county guy, born and raised in Chambers County, and I understand the rural counties as well as urban, but more so rural. The thing is, is that we have mostly r urban candidates that don't know anything about rural counties. All right, thank you. I think we'll close this out. Uh, Mr. West, you have 30 seconds. Well, I, I, let me put it like this. The, when you begin to look at my experiences, those experiences have benefited every Texan that I know. African-Americans, Latinos, women, uh, elderly, young folks, that's, what, that's what's happened. You know, the definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing over and over and over again to expect a different result. The fact is, if you look at Dallas County, I helped turn Dallas County blue and the same signs out here today. With me at the helm, with the experience and the support, we'll be able to get this done. Thank you. Ms. Ensign Ramirez, you are running as one of the most progressive candidates in this field. So progressive that Senator John Cornyn has started to refer to you as A.O. Christina. If elected, you will represent a state that polls show has conservative values and a, an approval rating of President Donald Trump that is higher than the national average. So how will you balance those conservative Texas values with your progressive views? Look, conventional wisdom would say that the most progressive Democratic presidential nominee wouldn't be leading in the polls in the state. The truth is that Texas voters want someone that is honest with them, that will tell them exactly where they stand. And I made a commitment that I was going to win on the merit of my ideas. That with me, you may not agree with every single issue, but you will know exactly where I stand because I believe that it's in the, that voters should be able to decide what's in their best interest for their families, their future, and their country. And that's how I'm going to win. Mr. Bill. Progressivism is fine, and I consider myself quite progressive, but I also think we need to steep our progressivism in common sense. And there are certain stands on issues that just go too far. And the Green New Deal is a perfect example. The Green New Deal has some great things in it and some great proposals, but it would also decimate the oil and gas industry here in the state of Texas. The oil and gas industry that 500,000 people depend on. So going all in with the Green New Deal does not make a whole lot of common sense, in my opinion. Ms. Hernandez. Have to disagree with uh, Mr. Bell and definitely with Ms. Sinsoon. Being a candidate who ran in 2018 for U.S. Senate, getting a quarter of a million votes on $4,000, our campaign was extremely progressive. And we did not capitulate to the political system. Unlike Ms. Sinsoon and Ms. Hagar, I wasn't recruited to run. I was compelled to run for U.S. Senate, and I do it on my own merits instead of going about talking about how I was part of the 2018 campaign for U.S. Senate, raised $80 million, and then lost to Ted Cruz. 
Senator West, I saw your hand. Yes, uh, we have to make certain that we have a dose of reality. No Democrat can win by being far left. It's not going to happen. We've got to be able to put together Democrats, Republicans, and independents. And most of those persons will be to the center, and probably to the left and to the right. And so you need to have someone that has those experiences, recognizes that pragmatism must exist in terms of this, this election, and be able to bring people together in order to win this election. Ms. Edwards, I saw your hand. I've had the great fortune of representing 2.3 million Texans. And when I sought to go about that journey, I had to build coalitions and coalitions across a broad spectrum of people. And that included people who were more conservative, people who were more progressive, and all of those in between. We have to have a candidate that can actually put coalitions that are broad in nature in place in order to be able to have the votes necessary to unseat John Cornyn and to deliver real change for all Texans. Mr. Foster. 10 to 15 counties in the state of Texas are urban. The rest are rural. You know, most of our candidates, as I said before, are out of touch with rural counties. They need someone who can go to those counties and talk to them about getting their money back and investing in their communities. Uh, Mrs. Hager, your name was invoked earlier. Do you have a response? You know, I grew up in a very blue collar family in a rural town called Leander, which is now a suburb, but 35 years ago it was definitely rural. And as I drive through all the rural counties, um, you know, I don't think that it's about progressive versus moderate. I think it's about being able to deliver bold ideas in a pragmatic way that shows people how we are going to help them keep food on the table and a roof over their head without having to work 60 or 70 hour a week. That's how we're going to win. Colonel Harris. Yes, I've been traveling out in West Texas a lot. Very red, very red. Uh, and I talk to people who claim to be independent but have always voted uh, conservative with the Republican Party. And I, and I show them my push card and I talk to them about my, my ideas. I tell them, to go to my website at victorfortexas.com. And they look at the ideas and they go, wow, you're sure you're a Democrat? So I'm a moderate Democrat. I have progressive ideas. And, they, and, they, and it resonates. I think I can bring that part over to us because it's not going to be about how much money you can shove down uh, media so that you can get elected. It's going to be about ideas. Thank you. Mr. Osagueta, you've been pretty quiet tonight. Do you have anything <laughs> to add to this? You know, um, I'm waiting to talk about ideas. S saying that people want to elect somebody on ideas is separate from actually presenting ideas. <laughs> so when that part of the program starts, let me know. I might just take a nap over here. Ms. Simpson Ramirez, we're going to give you 30 seconds to close. Look, to defeat John Cornyn, we need to drive up voter turnout. And no one knows how to do that better than me. I'm proud to have brought in thousands of new young voters into the political process and to have authored Beto O'Rourke Senate campaign plan to drive up Latino voter turnout and to be running a campaign as a working mom that knows how to harness the power of mothers everywhere. The truth is that we need a candidate that's willing to stand up for the issues that matter. When I am Texas's next senator, we will judge our economy by how well ordinary people are doing. We will make sure that health care is a guaranteed right of every single American. And we are going to rise to the occasion to tackle climate change and create Thank millions you, of good green jobs for Americans. Thank you. That is your time. Ms. Edwards, this next question is for you. Uh, you describe yourself as a, quote, pro-growth Democrat, perhaps suggesting you'll be friendlier to business than the other candidates. What is one policy issue that you would break away from the Democratic mainstream on when it comes to business climate or in favor of business growth? I think one of the ways that we oftentimes operate is in silos where we have government and we have the private sector and so forth. And I think what we have to do is embark upon public private partnerships as, as practical as they may be. So, for example, when I think about the issue of, of job loss and especially in rural markets, I'd like to see sustainable wage paying jobs with benefits incentivized to be relocated in those spaces and places so that you can begin to stimulate the economy. Some would not necessarily agree with that because it would require collaboration with the private sector in order to place those jobs there. But I think that's a means in which you are achieving the goal of providing economic opportunity for all Texans, no matter where they live. So that would be one example. Thank you very much. Senator West, I saw your hand. Again, we talk about experience. When you begin to look at my record in terms of balancing between business and also consumers, you see that I have the record to doing that. I agree that we must make certain we have partnerships, public-private partnerships. When I look at rural communities, I look at a lot of hospitals that are closing. 
And we must address that issue. We must bring business to the table as well as government to the table in order to address it. When I look at issues concerning broadband distribution in rural communities, we have studies over and over and over again. We should be able to incentivize business to make certain that we provide broadband opportunities to rural America. Thank you very much. Mr. Osegueda, I saw your hand first. Thank you. Um, two years ago when I ran for governor, I ran on a platform of structural change. And what that meant is that we needed to look to see where systems are not working. Uh, two particular industries that we know have been in the private sector that are not working are both healthcare and education. So the question is, is the solution a government funding solution and or do we also have to look at regulation? Um, I think there's an argument to be made that there are rational actors in the private sector that are promoting systems that are not actually working for us. And so there is a role for government to play when systems are breaking down. And education and healthcare are two where we're not just going to have to look at funding sources, but also look at what type of regulation changes that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, we have two more rebuttals. We got Mr. Cooper first, then we'll go to Mr. Bell. When you're talking about big business in Texas, uh, we have a lot of people moving to Texas right now. Amazon, uh, Toyota, Lexus, they just moved to the national headquarters from California, New York, in uh, North Dallas. Uh, we need to get these companies involved. You know, Donald Trump has given them the big tax break, but we need to. ExxonMobil was bragging about making $50 billion off the tax break in one quarter. I want some of that money to go towards education, at least 10% of the profits of the tax break that they receive to go towards education to get uh, Wi-Fi and bar brand uh, in, in uh, communities of the uh, rural areas. Thank you very much. We'll go to Mr. Bell and then we'll go to Ms. Edwards to close. I, I don't know anyone who is, isn't pro-growth in the Democratic Party. I think the, the real question is, where do we want to focus our attention and where do we want to see that growth? And I think the most important is in the most impoverished areas in, in the state. We have a great example in the city of Houston, a former landfill that is being proposed as a giant solar farm. It would be incredible for one of the poorest communities in, in Houston, Texas, and it's exactly the type of project the federal government needs to be getting behind. Thank you very much. Ms. Edwards, we'll give you 30 seconds to close on this topic. Absolutely. And when we look at providing economic opportunity for all Texans, one of the things that we must do is have an inclusive vision that prepares all Texans for today and tomorrow's economy. More people are afraid of what we call future of work or automation than they are even of foreign competition. And consequently, we also need our policies to reflect what's happening with automation and how does everybody in Texas have a place in the economy in light of that. One of the things we need to move toward, in addition to some of the examples that I've mentioned before, include portable workforce training credits that you can use lifelong. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. All right, Mr. Bell, back to you. Um, you are running on your experience, but that experience only includes two years in Congress and a series of failed campaigns. If voters are looking for experience, why should they select you over someone like State Senator Royce West? Well, when you mention failed campaigns, I'm really in pretty good company there. Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, Bernie Sanders, Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, and what sometimes gets lost in the narrative, and I appreciate you including it, is that I've also won and that I served three terms as a Houston City Council member. And I think if anybody looks at that record, they'll see very productive service. And while you say it's only one term in the United States Congress, it's more congressional experience than anyone on this stage has. I'm the only one who's actually served in Congress and the only one who's run statewide. And I think that will be invaluable in serving as a member of the United States Senate. And it will also be invaluable in being able to go toe to toe with John Cornyn and take him down. And that's re the real idea of, of this, this exercise. Hey, thank you. We only have time for two rebuttals. So uh, Ms. Soon and then Mr. West. You know, I think what Texas voters want is someone that understands what they go through and just how hard they work. You know, while John Cornyn was accepting millions of dollars from the construction industry, I was making $43,000 a year representing tens of thousands of workers that lost their limbs and lives in our state. I believe people want someone that's going to support them in raising the minimum wage, that's going to work for equal pay for women, and also make it easier to form a labor union in this state. Thank you. Mr. West. When you begin to look at my experiences, I'm able to put a face on it, the face of of uh, an uh, elderly person that has to be able to decide whether or not they're going to have a mortgage paid or pay, pay for their prescription. I'm able to look at people that are losing their homes. That's what I've been doing over these many years as a senator in dealing with the issue. And so if you want a person with real experience, I'm the person that you need in order to make certain that we get things done in Washington. 
Right, thank you. You have uh, 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Bell. I respect Senator West's uh, experience, but I think everyone agrees that the Texas legislature is not the United States Congress. And if you think about who the most successful U.S. senators, Democratic U.S. senators have been in recent memory, most would say Lyndon Baines Johnson and Lloyd Benson. And both had service in the House before serving in the U.S. Senate. And so I don't think it can be minimized at all. Thank you. All right, this next question is for all of the candidates. We are entering what we like to refer to as a lightning round phase. So in one word, tell us the quality you have that makes you the most qualified person on this stage to take on Senator John Cornyn. We'll begin with Mr. Cooper. Servant. Ms. Garcia. Corazon. Senator West. Experience. Mr. Bell. Compassion. Colonel Harris. Experience and education. Mr. Osegueda, one word. What quality do you have that makes you the most qualified person to take on S Senator John Cornyn? Insecurity. Mr. Foster. Imagination. Mrs. Hagar. Fighter. Ms. Sinson Ramirez. Courage. Ms. Edwards. Effective. And Ms. Hernandez. Human. All right, to our candidates, thank you. And to those of you who have been watching tonight's debate on television, thank you for tuning in. We will now return you to ABC's primetime programming. The Connors is next, but we will continue this debate live on KVU.com and the KVU YouTube channel. You can also listen on KUT 90.5 and your local public radio station. Don't forget, early voting is happening now. Vote, Texas. And for those of you who have been sticking with us, thank you. We want to invite you to be part of this debate. Help us decide what question to ask all of the candidates. Do you, our viewers and listeners, want to hear a question on health care, guns, immigration, marijuana, or race relations? You can vote right now in the KVU app or at kvu.com slash vote. Now let's continue our direct candidate questions. Patrick. A reminder for the candidates, you'll have 45 seconds to respond to your direct question. Other candidates can offer 30-second rebuttals if they choose. Then we will return to the original candidate for a closing statement. Ashley. All right, thank you, Patrick. So, Mr. Cooper, you have suggested that one way to reduce gun violence is to expand background checks to include high school conduct and suspensions for people who are under the age of 25. But that type of information is not public record and in Texas is protected by state law. So explain how this is a feasible proposal. It's a tough proposal. When you're thinking outside the box, uh, nothing uh, worth having is easy. Uh, so we have to fight for this. Uh, matter of fact, I'm also a psychologist, and uh, we created the HIPAA law so you can have your, your privacy protected. But what's more valuable, saving lives or, or keeping bullies that were aggressive or bullies that people that have been bullied, uh, information hidden? We need to figure out a better way to do the background checks to find out, like the young man that drove from Allen, Texas, to uh, El Paso, where my friend's daughter was shot and survived, thank God for that. But there were 22 that didn't survive. So I want to do all that I can to save one more life. And if I have to look at the background of young people like that, we probably could have uh, eliminated 22 deaths because he was expelled from school and had a horrible track record in conduct. Thank you. Mrs. Garcia. So in this country, we are such an outlier compared to any other country in the world. We have more people that die at the end of a barrel every week than most countries experience an entire year. And what I wanna know is, where is the outrage on this issue? We keep on referring to the same talking points. So when I was working for gun control, uh, handgun control in 2000, we need to come up with new solutions like demanding that all gun owners carry liability insurance so we can put an end to this epidemic. Thank you, Colonel Harris. So the question started with adolescents and guns. Um, my recommendation, and I have a five-point plan on how to deal with this, but specific to, to our adolescents is mental health support from grade school to high school. I think that'll create more resilient minds. And what we do now is we provide health, health support after the fact. We need to do it before that. So if we get them to change the culture of getting mental health uh, support from grade school to high school, I think that'll alleviate some of those problems that we're talking about. Ms. Susan Ramirez. 
You know, I grew up around guns, and I am a supporter of the Second Amendment, but I also graduated high school the year of the Columbine shooting. And I've been waiting for my entire adult life to see Congress act and do very basic things like pass universal background checks. And instead, we decided to teach a generation of school children to learn how to play dead in their classrooms. And it's why I'm a proud supporter of the March for Your Lives Peace Plan, one of the most comprehensive plans to deal with the gun violence epidemic in this country. Ms. Hernandez, I saw your hand. One of the most basic things that we can do is register our guns. A lot of the violence that is happening is as a result of desperation, whether it's economic instability and uh, inequality in our healthcare system and implementing Medicare for all uh, from the beginning of birth till the moment someone dies is great, but also implementing it in our schools, ensuring that the kids have a way to express themselves as well as having mental health care for <coughs> our veterans, which are committing, 22, which are committing uh, suicides 22 uh, a day. Mr. Foster. Yes, uh, if we bring pressure to bear on manufacturers, creating a situation where they have to use fingerprint technology on all triggers, it doesn't matter. Yes, it's expensive, but it's worth the cost. Okay, and Mr. Cooper, we'll give you 30 seconds to close. Great, thank you. Um, when you talk about universal background check and, and all the gun laws and closing the loopholes, that's great. But we need to make sure that our Medicare for all, Medicaid for all, expanded Medicaid, includes psychological background check and, and includes uh, making sure that our children are stable from K through 12. We need to assist them in those areas. Anger unmanaged is a very mental ill situation. It creates mental illness. You have to manage your anger. You need assistance. Ms. Hernandez, this next question is for you. Fighting climate change is one of your top priorities, if not the top priority for you. In a state like Texas that relies so heavily on the oil and gas industry, what sacrifices do you believe people should be prepared to make in their daily lives to address the climate crisis? I don't think that there should be much sacrifices as far as workers, but we know that the fossil fuel industry will no longer be subsidized using our taxpayer dollars so that they can continue to profit and take that money overseas in which other countries are benefiting from that tax haven, including providing those countries Medicare for all. What I would like to see is a Green New Deal implemented where there is a transition that includes workers and prioritizes local communities so that we can build our crumbling, re rebuild our, re our crumbling infrastructure as well as employ people within our communities that way we have control of our electric grid. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Sinzun Ramirez, then Senator West, and, and Mr. Bell, the one. Order well, I support the Green New Deal because I believe we must and can transition off of fossil fuels because the science is clear that our entire survival depend on, depends on it. And I believe we can do it because I believe in the power of the American people. The Green New Deal is based off of our national transformation we made to tackle the threat of World War II. I believe with the same level of investment and leadership with the Green New Deal, we can win this fight too. Thank you very much, uh, Senator West. I believe also that we've got to make certain that we transition from fossil fuel to uh, renewable energy. We have to do that. That has to be the dominant fuel. In Texas, obviously we can't, we've got to balance moving in that direction with our economy here. And we've got to make certain that those workers that in the fossil fuel industry are able to get retraining in, in, in maybe the new energy. We've got to also make certain we have uh, research and development in terms of how do we store this energy. To the extent that we can put re dollars into research and development for storage, we're going to be ahead of the curve to make certain that we move to that new economy and that new energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Bell. We need to rejoin the Paris Accords. We need to transition to alternative forms of energy, and we need to focus on green infrastructure. And nothing sickens me more than the fact that uh, we have a climate denier as a United States senator. <clears throat> the senator from Texas needs to be leading on this issue. We're in a perfect position to do so because of our abundance of renewable resources. And we can get there. And we can get there working with the oil and gas industry to lower emissions as we transition to alternative sources of energy. Thank you very much. I saw Mrs. Hager and then Ms. Edwards. You know, it's not a question of of whether or not we're gonna to go to renewable energy. It's clear that globally we're trending toward innovative technology and, and clean mm. renewable energy. And I think that the, the people who actually live in these areas and work in the industry, especially out in the Permian Basin, they're used to this boom and bust cyclical thing. And we need to make sure that we have a leader who can be forward thinking and actually embrace renewable energy and make sure that Texas continues to lead in the energy industry and take us the way of Netflix instead of going the way of Blockbuster by, you know, doggedly holding on to this old technology. Thank you. Ms. Edwards. 
I live in a place that is both home to uh, the energy capital of the world, but then at the same time is home to the space and place where there's been four 500 year flood events in the last five years. We know that climate change is real. It costs us lives, it costs us billions of dollars. I think there are sensible policies that can be implemented, namely those that include trying to subsidize and, and support the use of clean and renewable energies, but also building infrastructure like high capacity transit options so that we can continue to live a lifestyle that's consistent with being good stewards of our environment are just a few examples. Thank you very much. I wanna give Ms. Hernandez an opportunity to close. Mr. Foster, did I see a hand from you. Go ahead. Yes. Well, let me say this. The candidates up here obviously do not believe in the people of Texas or Americans. Why did I say that? Because of the fact that they don't give us the opportunity to invest in our communities to allow for training of citizens so they can have the shot to basically for carbon extraction and solar panel technology, water technology. Go to my website, www.votejackdaniel.com, and read Public Controlled Capitalism. Thank you very much. Mr. Hernandez, we'll go to you to close. Well, I believe that nobody here in this, uh, it, on this stage understands and knows what it is like to be living in a sacrifice zone and being uh, exposed to the constant toxic chemicals with no uh, way to get any kind of justice for our communities. As an organizer, as someone who has actively evacuated my family from the area, as well as developing air monitors for our communities, I'm the one who is best equipped to take on John Cornyn and the fossil fuel industry because I'm not here to capitulate for, for them or accept any donations for for, for them. I don't just sign pledges. I actually take action. Thank you very much. Colonel Harris, you've said the most important issue facing every Texan is immigration and that as someone who grew up partly in Mexico and then later in the Rio Grande Valley, um, you are uniquely qualified to create immigration policy. Name one policy that you could put into place today that could make an impact. Uh, can you repeat the, the very end? Yeah. Name one policy that could be put into place today that would make an impact. Well, the first thing we probably need to address is the fact that these, these um, immigrants are coming over here for a reason. So what we need to do is not have open borders, not have closed borders, but controlled borders, where we channel people to come in and process them properly instead of putting them in cages and let them stay. So I would remove the cages and, and put more, um, law, uh, more judges down there to process people and bring them into the system sooner and so that they can start being effective in our economy because we don't have enough people to sustain our economy if we keep kicking people out. Uh, other countries are getting ready to take a nosedive in their economy because their population is getting older. That's not a problem that we have in the United States because we have this immigration from the south. So readily available access to, to our economy is what we need. Thank you. Ms. Eason? Today, I outlined on my website my plan to create a new era for immigration in Texas. I spent a decade working alongside immigrant workers who lost their limbs and lives because our country was willing to accept their labor but not their full humanity. Let's be clear. On this issue, we've let the GOP control the narrative. And our current immigration system is ineffective, it's cruel, and it's inhumane. We need a system that benefits not just big corporations and the politicians they support, but protects immigrant and American workers and keeps families together. My plan does just that. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez. Well, as someone who is a daughter of immigrants and understands what uh, ICE does to families tearing them apart, I have not only um, experienced that, but I have also been part of getting someone out of ICE detention centers and know what that does to a family. Um, I have not seen anyone here that has done that for someone other than their own family member. Um, and doing that and implementing policies that will dismantle ICE as well as implementing immigration reform bills that will genuinely protect people, but also acknowledging that there are climate refugees is something extremely Thank important that we need to do. Thank you. That's your time, Mr. Bell. I just crossed over the border yesterday to walk through the tent city across from Brownsville, and it is shameful and it is heartbreaking, and we're better than this. And in terms of policies, one policy that would make a huge difference is the repeal of Section 1325 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. There's no reason to treat immigrants 
with uh, as criminals and we need to start treating them with compassion and, and move in that direction and we need to have a pathway to citizenship not only that, for the dreamers that's your time thank you uh, mr west i want to make certain we have a pathway to citizenship for the dreamers and, all, and the 11 million or so immigrants that are quote unquote in the shadow even though they're paying taxes we've got to come up with comprehensive immigration reform in this country and we can't do it just by executive order. We've got to make certain that we look down on the border and see whether or not the privacy rights of persons on that border are in fact being observed. They have aerial stats in the sky and I was told a couple of weeks ago that those aerial stats can look inside homes where there are heat signals of individuals there. We have to protect the privacy rights of Thank persons you. on the border. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Hagar, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, Yeah. you know, um, in addition to the humanitarian aspect of this, and, and, and it is a humanitarian crisis, there's a national security implication here that, that nobody's touching on that, you know, we're losing our standing as leaders of the free world. We're losing our influence globally. Um, we're we're really giving ourselves a black eye and, and losing credibility with our allies. We've got to have comprehensive immigration reform that's more in line with who we are as Americans and our values if we're to remain the leaders of the free world and the beacon of freedom and hope and democracy to those who would seek a better future for their kids. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Garcia. This is very personal to me because my husband is a naturalized citizen, and um, and as also as an attorney, I've worked <clears throat> pro bono for, uh, for asylum seekers in this country. Uh, tomorrow, in connection with my 420-mile walk across Texas, I'm spending the night in the same uh, encampment that um, Chris visited uh, tomorrow. And so um, we need to shine a light on what's going down there. In addition, if I'm lucky enough to be the next senator from Texas on November 4th, I'm moving down there, I'm taking my law degree, and I'm going to figure out how we reunify these families because this is a crime against humanity. Thank you. And Ms. Edwards. I think certainly we can agree that what's happening at our border is an atrocity that is inconsistent with our American values. But I think what we must do next is embark upon codifying into law comprehensive immigration form, reform. Right now, we have a system set up where it's just been immigration policy vis-a-vis -vis executive order, where there's not been stability. If you look at what happened with DACA uh, recipients and they getting the, the rug pulled from, out under, from underneath them, we can't continue on this way. We need to have comprehensive immigration reform that includes pathways towards citizenship as well. Thank you. And uh, Colonel Harris, you have 30 <clears throat> seconds to close. So it's clearly you really can't cover all that in just one minute. So if you go to my website, victorfortexas.com, you'll see a comprehensive plan on how to do that. But one thing I will tell you is that that I completely disagree with sanctuary cities. We should be a sanctuary country and we should go away with the sanctuary cities where people can go to the police and get help if they need help. Right now we've got people that refuse to do that because they don't want to get deported. We need to let policing do policing and we need to have a sanctuary country, not sanctuary cities. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Garcia, you've said Democrats have let Republicans take ownership of family values and national security. How would you reclaim those arenas as a Democrat if elected? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do as Democrats is, is acknowledge the fact that what we've been doing hasn't been working. And so we need to be the party of moral clarity and, and political bravery on all issues. And one of the, I think one of the key ways in which we've ceded ground is by saying that we are not the party of family values or allowing the GOP to claim that mantle. The reality is that we are more family values than, than the GOP because when we look at what it takes to raise a family, we are uh, pro-universal health care. We are pro- um, uh, uh, um, family leave. We are uh, pro um, a minimum uh, wage. We support the entire family and the entire individual, and we need to stop coming into this with the idea that we are not uh, pro family and pro uh, values. Thank you. Ms. Sinsun Ramirez. You know, I think. Uh, Ms. Garcia is right that we have to take back that mantle from the Republican Party on the issues that really matter to families, including leaving it up to women to decide when they are ready to make a family. That's our <clears throat> issue. When we look at the fact that there's only five countries in the whole world that don't offer paid maternity leave, that's an issue that we stand for, and we stand for universal pre-K. We are the party that is making families and our country strong. Ms. Hernandez. Well, the Democratic Party is also the party that funds the Patriot Act and that funds Trump's endless wars. 
and continues to capitulate to the, the Republican Party. So if anything, I think it's time to change the old guard of the Democratic Party to new leadership. And it is up to us to usher that in. And electing someone like myself to the U.S. Senate in Texas will definitely shift that control back to what it is to be a Democrat. Mr. Cooper, I believe I saw your hand. Yes, uh, I say I think we've lost our voice. What's, what's the voice of moral authority? Uh, is it moral to send uh, children to school and tell them to learn and we're not feeding them? Is it moral to send children to school and they're wearing the same clothing daily and, and they're dirty? Is it moral that uh, we had a senator for uh, 30 years now being in public service and still uh, African-American women are number one to die after childbirth? Uh, what was the moral authority? What's the voice of moral authority in those issues? Thank you. Mr. Bell. I don't know how the Republicans can claim to be the party of family values when they put policies in place that have created the greatest income inequality that we've ever seen in the United States of America, where you put policies into effect where individuals are forced to work sometimes three jobs just in order to have enough money to scrape by. I think if people really look closely, they'll see that the Democratic Party is the party of family values. Mrs. Hagar. I think we're in a national security crisis, and I agree um, with with mama back here, um, because frankly, we are destroying our relationships with our allies. We have seen our State Department get gutted. Um, we have withdrawn from agreements, and we are in a worse situation now um, with North Korea and Iran. But I would add on to that that we need to also take back that we're the ones who step up for individual rights and freedoms and the Constitution, the rule of law, the co-equal branches of government. We're the ones who want a woman to determine when she's going to have a child. We're the ones who want you to determine who you're going to marry and, and get the government out of these issues. Thank you. Senator West. Yeah, we believe in civil, <laughs> civil rights of all groups, whether you're LGBTQ, whether you're African-American or, or, or an, a, an Hispanic, we believe in that. And when you begin to think about the family values, we have our Republican friends that talk about they are pro-life, but yet and still they'll fight, for, fight against a woman's right to make a decision. But once they say they're pro-life, once a child is born, then they abandon the child in terms of uh, support. Whether that child needs support through uh, schools or uh, health care, they abandon the child. Thank you. Mrs. Garcia, we'll give you 30 seconds to close. The reality is that life should not be this hard in the richest country in the history of the world. And we are running out of time to right the ship. Frankly, the Democratic Party has been chicken shitting the bed uh, since uh, 2016. And what I mean by that expression is that we have ceded our moral compass and our values, and yet we still walk away empty handed at the end of the day. And so we need to stop giving up on the things that we truly believe in, and we need to fight like hell for Texans. Thank you. Mr. Osegueda, this next question is for you. Uh, you have taken issue with the entire system of modern politics. So what, what is one reform to our political system that you believe will transform the system when it comes to how we conduct our elections or how we fund or conduct our campaigns? Sure. Um, let me start just with saying it doesn't matter how strongly you advocate for any of the things that we believe in on this side of the aisle. What is happening in our country is we're exceedingly polarized. So what we see is when you go to Washington, um, <clears throat> policy are not getting adopted. They're not even being brought up for considerations. One of my views is a 20% minority rule where the minority party would have 20% of the agenda. So you could see something like on gun control that Chuck Schumer could utilize that 20% to bypass uh, Mitch McConnell and actually get uh, an up or down vote and at least get a debate on a lot of these issues. So that's just one concrete issue of structural change at the state uh, rules uh, area where we can start addressing how we actually start increasing the velocity of legislation. It's important to increase the velocity of legislation because this is all social science. We still need to see how to measure it and then how to adjust it over time. Thank you very much. I saw Mr. Bell, Ms. Zun Ramirez, Colonel Harris, and, and Mr. Hernandez. I'll try to remember that order and we'll, we'll go in it. <laughs> Mr. Bell. Well, we need to do away with Citizens United. Obviously, uh, Citizens United has taken money in politics and put it on steroids, and we find, need to look for other ways to take money <clears throat> out of politics. Uh, corporate lobbyists, uh, or, or now corporations, pay more for their lobbyists than we pay to fund the entire United States Congress. And if that is, doesn't uh, suggest a broken system, I don't know what will. Thank you. Ms. Susan Ramirez. 
I believe that we need elected officials that are more beholden to the American people than their corporate donors. To do that, to protect the rules of our democracy, we have to make sure that we have nationally uh, financed elections, publicly financed elections, automatic voter registration, and I want to make Election Day a national federal holiday so that we can have as much participation in our democracy as possible. Thank you. Colonel Harris, your turn. Yeah, I just want to add to the national holiday, for, but additional to that, um, I would say a tax rebate for people who vote. But uh, some of the things that we need to do to change, that, like uh, Adrian brought up, 20% rule, and uh, Chris brought up the family, uh, Citizens United. But uh, also, you know, we need to address term limits. I know one of the candidates on this stage believes in term limits, but not for herself. So I think that's an issue when, when people who are trying to get elected don't want to don't want to see it end. Don't want that gravy train to end. And I think that's what's hurting her. Thank you very much. Mr. Hernandez, we'll go to you now. Well, I definitely agree with Mr. Oseguera that there has to be some structural change going on in our government so that at least a simple majority can pass legislation through in the Senate and in the House. We need to ensure that we do overturn Citizens United. And as a senator, I would instruct that we put into legislation federal uniform voting laws so that states can no longer discriminate or marginalize communities further by imposing laws that disenfranchise voters. Got it. I want to go to uh, Ms. Hager next, but uh, Mr. Cooper, did I miss your hand over here? No, but I, I'm good, yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. thanks. We'll go to Ms. Hager, and then if, if you want to weigh in, you yeah, can. Wait. <clears throat> so one of the reasons I was endorsed by End Citizens United is because pointing out to people the link between bad legislation and corporate money in politics is something that I'm really passionate about. So John Cornyn legislates in a way that lines the pockets of the gun lobby, allows a quarter of a million weapons to be trafficked south of our border, which causes a violence epidemic where 80% of the violence is used by an American gun, and then that causes a humanitarian crisis and he gets his second cut. He gets his first check from the gun lobby, his second check from the private detention facilities that are at maximum capacity and profiting off of the humanitarian crisis. So that's what we're, we're trying to fight. Thank you very much. We'll go to Mr. Cooper, and then we'll go back to Mr. Osegueda to close. You were reading my mind because I, I did want to say something. I didn't raise my hand, but thank you. Uh, it's going back to the golden rule. Those who have the gold, they're making the rules. So I want to take the money out of the politics, and that would hurt people on this stage. But I'm okay with that because we need to vet our candidates, and we need to set aside a certain budget for our candidates that's unknown, and we need fresh blood. And in, and in order to do that, we need to have the exposure to those candidates with uh, public uh, television, pu public radio. Uh, you have Channel 8 News right there in uh, uh, Houston, Texas, that's available for those type of programs. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Osegueda, we'll let you close. Sure. I think a part of the polarization is actually what's going on with local media. Local media tends to cover the horse races. So they tend to cover fundraising, who's raising the most money. They're not covering the issues, which doesn't help our society actually learn what the issues are and propose solutions. So I actually find it rich that MJ Hager wants to address fi campaign finance when a, a pack of hers has been putting out ads that cover nothing about issues. It's not informing the average voter of what, to, what issues to attack, what issues to look at, and giving the public a better, deeper understanding of issues so that when they actually go to the polls, they have education about what the issues are that they're actually selecting a candidate for. Thank you very much. We'll just go to Ms. Hager uh, quickly to uh, respond to him invoking your name. I, I'm so proud to have the support of an organization like Vote Vets, and that's the organization he's talking about. Vote Vets is absolutely committed to getting more veterans in office because of exactly what we've been talking about, regaining our status as the leader of the free world and being able to, to speak with national security issues at the forefront. Um, because, frankly, we don't have enough legislators and leaders that have military experience. Um, and then they go and, and commit us to wars and to deploy us like they're playing with little green army plastic toys like my toddlers are. Um, so I'm very proud to have the support of Vote Vets. Thank you very much. We'll go to our next question now. Mr. Foster, you tout that you are the only candidate with a transformative economic plan. And to fund that plan, you suggest the country go further into debt. How is increasing the deficit economically sound? It's economically sound because of the fact that we're going to invest in new taxpayers increase the value of the dollar, and then once we have all these new included taxpayers, then we can begin to pay. We have to prepare our society for that because we ultimately are going to have to, we ultimately are going to, have to increase the taxes. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Garcia. 
So as a banking and finance attorney, I relish the idea of sitting down with all of our loan agreements um, and figuring out how we reduce our debt. As the mother of three, I know that what comes in is just as important as what goes out. And so I want to sit down and I want to figure out how we, we actively try to reduce this debt because we need to, we need to get this under the control. You don't, you're not going to run your household like this. We can't run our country like this. All right, thank you. Uh, we only have time for two more. I think I saw Ms. Hernandez and Ms. Seenstone raise right. their hands first. Yeah. Well, so, Ms. Off, Hernandez, yeah. thank you. There is no debt. That's the reality. It's the facade. We're constantly putting money into our military, but we're constantly always saying that there's no money for <clears> these <throat> programs that would uplift people out of poverty, such as Medicare for All or, living the, or lifting the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We continuously give this lie that there is no money when we know that there is. It's just that it, they prefer to see it in ways that are more profitable for industry. And I am one who definitely supports Medicare for All and know that there is plenty of money to go around to fund that. Because, you know, we just did the greatest transfer of wealth by giving the billionaires tax cuts. Thank you. That's your time. Uh, Ms. Insun. You know, aside from overturning the tax cuts of Donald Trump that went to billionaires and big corporations, we need to make sure we're building long term a more fair tax system. When LBJ was our president, the highest income tax bracket in this country played 70 percent. Today, it's just 37 percent. I want to make sure that when I go to Washington, we judge our economy by how well working and middle class families are, are doing. OK, great. Uh, we have only time for 30 well, seconds for you to close, Mr. Foster. Well, what I want people to understand is when we invest in people for skilled trades and they make higher wages, that's going to increase the value of the dollar. <clears throat> and so when people begin to be included into the economy, we're going to be able to pay off all our debts, ultimately. Thank you. Well, it is now time for our viewer questions. So earlier in the debate, we asked you <coughs> to vote on a topic, health care, guns, immigration, marijuana, or race relations. And 38% of you said you wanted to hear a question on marijuana. Each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to our next question. More states are legalizing recreational and medical use of marijuana, creating a patchwork of laws where something that is legal in one state can land a person in jail in another state. So when it comes to marijuana, do you support full legalization or any change to current federal law? Mr. Cooper, we'll begin with you. Yes, uh, in my economics class 232, one of the things we discussed and looked at was California. They said, follow what California does, and you're going to find out what the rest of the United States is going to do. So it's legal in California. And they just passed, uh, I think, a, a, an act or a law where uh, it's no longer illegal to use your uh, card to buy the marijuana. So when it's legal in, uh, in, in Texas, I want to make sure all of the proceeds and, the, and money that goes from it goes towards education, rebuilding our infrastructure, and also help out uh, so we can expand Medicaid and then Medicare for all our citizens. Mrs. Garcia. Normal had a marijuana forum a couple of weeks ago, and I was the only candidate on the stage to attend because I truly believe that this is key to understanding that if we legalize marijuana, we abate human suffering in three ways. One, medical use of marijuana helps people across the board. Two, we go and we release people in jail. Fifty percent of all drug offenses are for uh, the possession of, of marijuana in this country. And we need to look at how we take the legalization of marijuana and we apply all all of that tax revenue that's going to come into our state and our in our country and how we're going to apply it to social welfare programs such as early childhood uh, intervention here in Texas. And just a reminder for the candidates, you'll all have a moment to, to speak on this. Uh, Senator West, you're next. I, I agree with Annie back here that we need to legalize it in this country and we need to make certain that the tax uh, the taxes that we place on on the sales are used for education. I agree with Mr. Cooper on that and any other social programs. When you begin to look at the incarceration rate, 47 percent of all persons that are incarcerated are there because of drug related offenses. You said 50 percent for marijuana. It makes no sense at all, especially when you talk about thirty one thousand dollars per month per, per year in terms of incarceration. And half of the persons incarcerated are there because of drug offenses. We need to make certain that we get the those persons out, give them treatment if they need to, but make certain that we have a, a infrastructure, a legal infrastructure in place that takes care of the issues concerning marijuana. Marijuana should, in fact, be legalized across this country. Thank you. Mr. Bell. Well, we declared a war on drugs a long time ago, and we lost. And we need to admit that and move forward. 
when during the war on drugs, we decided that we would make addicts into criminals, and we've done ourselves no favors whatsoever. And of course, I support the legalization of marijuana. Uh, alcohol is legal in this state and in this country. And I'm sure we're going to have to put safeguards in place and there will be some abuse of marijuana and we will have to deal with that. But meanwhile, uh, it's not going away and it could be an extraordinary cash crop for farmers here in Texas. So yes, I support the legalization of marijuana. Thank you, Colonel Harris. Definitely support that, uh, especially medicinal, especially making it legal across the board to, um, through the country so that VA uh, recipients can, can use it. Right now they can't because they'll, they'll to take the benefits away if they're, if they're tested. Um, legalizing across the board as well to the country for uh, recreational as well. We have already have studies from the different states that have had it. There's no big issues, should be no reason. Uh, remove people that are incarcerated because of these low uh, crimes. And I think that's, where the, that's the way we should be going. Like, like uh, Chris said, you know, alcohol is legal. Um, I don't think marijuana is gonna be that much worse. And I think the studies from the other states prove that. Thank you, Mr. Osagueda. Uh, honestly, not a high priority for me in my agenda. Um, <clears throat> I'll look at it. Um, I'm sure there are some other implications in terms of how to actually implement it that um, either deal with agriculture, um, interstate commerce, those types of things. Um, not high on my priority list, but I'll meet with whoever wants to forward legalizing it um, and see um, what the impacts would be in terms of actually implementing it and what those challenges actually would uh, consist of. Mr. Foster. Yes, first of all, let me say this. You should be high on life, but you know, that's okay. Uh, I'm definitely uh, for legalizing marijuana. I have no problem with that, but you have to respect the city ordinances just so people would not, you know, get carried away with smoking marijuana. Thank you, Mrs. Hagar. So I just feel like someone has to say, I don't think Texas should ever do anything following California. I don't think that we should, you know, make any policies because California's uh, leading on that. That's for sure. But um, I can tell you whether it's the impact of criminal justice, um, the tax revenue that we could get from it. Clearly, I think it, most people agree that we should legalize marijuana. Being a veteran and being in a community where people suffer, whether it's from high suicide rates or PTSD or opioid uh, the opioid epidemic. This is something that marijuana could help in every chapter. And the reason that I think it needs to go beyond medical is that most veterans are not self-identifying and seeking treatment and doing the necessary things that it would take to actually get a prescription. Ms. Simpson Ramirez. I absolutely support legalizing marijuana. In addition, I want to make sure we're looking at the long-term harm the drug war has caused hundreds of thousands of people in our country, especially communities of color. John Boehner sits on the board of a cannabis investment corporation. He's now profiting off of this very same product where people are sitting behind bars across this country, including in states where marijuana has been legalized. We need an immediate review of all of those cases as we legalize marijuana and also make sure how we invest in communities that have been truly underserved by the war on drugs that we all know has been a racist war on drugs as well. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Well, I believe in, uh, I do believe that we should legalize marijuana, but I also think we need to do an overhaul on some of uh, making sure that our, our banking practices are consistent. So right now, for some states that allow for uh, the use of proceeds from the sale of marijuana, you can't bank in a, in a separate bank or one that might have national scope. So we need to make sure that our banking laws will allow that interstate <coughs> commerce to take place in a manner that is consistent with the way in the direction that the country is heading with its marijuana laws that exist to date. Ms. Hernandez. Well, I can say it's probably I'm the only one up here who has ever smoked marijuana. Uh, I absolutely support the legalization and decriminalization of marijuana on a federal level and ensuring that we do uh, attack this war on drugs head on and repealing the Crime Act, which has disproportionately targeted communities of color and incarcerated more black and brown bodies than white counterparts uh, for the same crime of smoking marijuana. So, hey, do it. Let's free the weed. All right, thank you to our candidates for that. <laughs> Another topic viewers wanted to hear about was health care. All of you want to expand access to health care. What's the best pathway to do that? And again, you will all be able to answer this question, but I'll start with Ms. Hagar. So <clears throat> when I 
was working in healthcare. I worked in healthcare for five years. I got pregnant with my first son, Jude, which is a pre-existing condition. And then I was facing getting laid off from that job. And I thought back to when I had the best care, and that was TRICARE, which is basically military Medicare. I would like to see access to Medicare for all Texas families. I think that access to quality, affordable health care is a human right, but it's also important that we understand that we need to protect the rights of individuals and Texas families to determine what that means for them. So I support a public option. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sinsun Ramirez. Look, by allowing private health insurance companies to profit off of our illness and pain, we've not only created the most expensive health care system in the world, but one with some of the worst health care outcomes of any industrialized nation on the planet. I believe it should be the right of every single American to go to the doctor when they're sick. And that will be our right with a Medicare for all system. There will be no co-pays, no deductibles, just high quality health care for every single American. Thank you. Mr. Bell. We need access to Medicare for all if people want to hold on to their private insurance policies, that's fine, but uh, we have to allow people to either buy in or opt in to, to Medicare if we're ever going to address the affordability issue. Uh, we also need to lower the price of prescription drugs. It makes no sense that we're paying more for prescription drugs than uh, any other country in the world and crushing our seniors. And we also need to turn back the attacks on Planned Parenthood uh, closing down Planned Parenthood clinics that have provided access to health care for thousands of disadvantaged women uh, is only going to lead to more uh, unwanted pregnancies and not fewer. Thank you. Ms. Edwards. When I was 10 years old, my father was diagnosed with cancer and he passed away when I was 17. But through his experience, I learned about the urgency, the life and death nature of our health care system in this country. I think we need to have that lens when thinking about what is the appropriate next step for health care access. I believe we need to provide for a public option for those for whom uh, employer based insurance coverage does not work. But also we need to make sure that we're closing the short term insurance loopholes, reducing the price of uh, uh, prescription drugs and, of course, making sure that those premiums are going down because these are all barriers that people uh, are facing when trying to access affordable, accessible care. And those are imperative that we actually get those things done now because lives are lying in the balance. Thank you. Mr. West. I agree with most of my colleagues up here that we need to make certain that we have a, that health care is a basic right to all Americans. <laughs> that we have a public option, that we try to fix the issues uh, that surround Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, pre-existing conditions. We've got to make certain that we deal with those issues. We have a court case that's currently in the balance. We've got to figure out exactly how the court is going to rule on that and make certain you have a senator that can address the issue. The other issue is how do we afford to pay for it? I think that we need to kind of look, look at these uh, tax breaks that were given by uh, Trump and make certain that we create a dedicated health care account to the extent that we can re re repeal some of those tax cuts, take the money that would ordinarily go in the pockets of those one percenters and put it in a dedicated health care account and make certain we use that in order to uh, change Medicare, Thank uh, you. Med medical system in this country. Thank you. Ms. Garcia. My daughter was uh, born, unbeknownst to us, with a congenital heart defect. And at about six weeks old, she collapsed in my husband's arms, uh, barely breathing. We learned after the fact that she had been slowly suffocating for the first six weeks of her life. And after one and a half million dollars of treatment, she survived. This happened in Spain. And because of that, I was able to start a nonprofit organization and give back because we didn't have to worry about going bankrupt with the, the hospital bill. This is a right that every American deserves, and it makes financial sense. It's something that we can do here, and I want universal health care that looks like Spain with no co pays, no co insurance, all the different ways in which they, they go and voice the costs onto individuals. And if we do that, we're going to have a healthier, happier, and richer America. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez. Well, as someone who has worked in, in health care and has uh, seen the death of multiple people who have had access to health care, although it was unaffordable, and someone who has also worked in the insurance industry, I understand the inequalities in the health care system. I know how to fix them. I know that supporting the plan of Medicare for All will ensure that the, the maternal mortality rate is also decreased and that uh, women are no longer considered pre-existing conditions simply because we can have children. Ensuring that no one goes without health care. Ensuring that veterans are able to not just go to the VA system, but also go to other health care facilities that are nearby and get the access that they truly need and deserve is, is extremely imperative to, to, uh, to many people across this country. And health care is a human right, but it is being denied by the health insurance industry. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. 
Medicare for All is a very simple fix, and it comes towards education again. Once our youth are graduating at 18 years of age and they're uh, now ready for work and making 50 to 80 thousand dollars a year, they are now paying into the system, not part of the system. Uh, immediately, we have to expand Medicaid. Uh, I have a son that's 26 years of age; he's kicked off the insurance already. So we have to fix Medicaid, expand that immediately, and then work towards Medicare for All. And we do that by having paying, uh, uh, working. Uh, youth at 18 years of age, not incarcerating them and not uh, raising up uh, the, the maximal uh, prison uh, issues. So we, we need to make sure that we have our youth paying into the system. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Harris. Yes, I, I support a universal health care. I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, I contract cancer as a result of combat operations in the Middle East. I was lucky I was still on active duty and I was able to get taken care of. Uh, I was getting paid and I was getting medical treatment. And there was a, that was a big worry off my head. We need our people to be able to do that, to be able not to worry about getting sick and not be able to pay the bills because they're in the hospital or because they're getting treatment. Uh, I have a specific plan on how to get there. Um, and it's on my website, victorfortexas.com. And it outlines exactly how to get there. But the first thing we do is we need to reduce the cost and we do that through technology. Uh, so, so in way we support rural communities is through mobile clinics. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foster. Yes. Uh, first of all, people want a hand up, not a handout. <coughs> now, we have a system here that does not show any restoration equivalents. What I mean is a taxpayer in a rural community go, have to take a two or, two or three hour trip to Houston or wherever they're from just to get to the medical center to see their doctor. There is no equality in that. There is not making, it does not make the lady or woman whole when they have to do that. They are paying their taxes. We need to bridge the gap by putting some kind of Medicare center or something in between that. People need to be compensated for that. Thank you. And Mr. Osteguer, we'll end with you. Sure, thank you. Um, I think a lot of our discussion doesn't focus on cost. Um, cost has to be beyond technology. We have uh, shortages in doctors, we have shortages in nurses, so you're still having to look systematically in terms of whether our institutions can actually train those personnel as, well, personnel as well. We know that it's healthcare cost that is driving that inflation. Another thing that we, when we talk about Medicare for All, we don't talk about the portion of the premiums that are currently paid by the private sector. So to adopt Medicare for All would be one of the biggest wealth transfers from the pu private public sector to the private sector because uh, we would be fulfilling uh, the premiums that private sector currently addresses. So it's a lot more complicated. Um, the Thank you. Well, our next question is for all of the candidates. Several of you have mentioned Medicare for all, but we've only seen it on paper one time by one person thus far right now. So simply yes or no, do you support Senator Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill as it is currently filed in the U.S. Senate? Mr. Cooper. Yes. Mrs. Garcia. See. Si. Yes. Senator West. No. Mr. Bell. No. Mr. Oseguera. No. Mr. Foster. No. Mrs. Hagar. No. Mrs. Simpson Ramirez. Proudly, yes. Ms. Edwards. No. Ms. Hernandez. Yes. The next question is open no. to. Oh, Colonel Harris, <laughs> I apologize for skipping over you. you. But tell us your answer one more time. No. Got it. Thank you. Uh, then this next question is open to the, all the candidates, and you have 45 seconds to respond. If you'd like to respond, please raise your hand, make sure I see you. Um, right now we have time, I think, for about four responses. I'll try to get to as many people as I can who I see first. Um, maybe a little hard. <laughs> you all have proposed uh, progressive gun policies, from universal background checks to banning private sales. Some of you want mandatory buyback of assault-style <coughs> rifles. In a gun-friendly state like Texas, how will you persuade, persuade people to get on board with these ideas? So Mr. Bell, Senator West, Mr. Mrs. Garcia and Mr. Cooper. So Mr. Bell first. We need a mandatory ban and buyback program, and I think people understand that after the tragic shootings that they've seen here in, in the state of Texas. And we need to bring back sanity uh, to the process. We also need universal background checks and red flag laws, and nothing demonstrates the brokenness of our democracy uh, more so than the fact that 80 to 90 percent of Americans 
are in favor of that legislation and Congress refuses to do anything because of the NRA that represents exactly 6% of gun owners. But the good news is, is that Moms Demand Action is now raising more than the NRA. And I guarantee you that organization is not going to stop until we have real gun safety legislation and they're going to make a dramatic difference in 2020. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. <clears throat> I agree with uh, Chris on several of those factors, but obviously we've got to also deal with issues concerning mental health. And the red flag <clears throat> laws are very important because when you had a situation up in Allen, Texas, the young man that went to El Paso, there was a call to police officers. And we've got to make certain that people can call when there's an issue that they think that a person is going to be using a weapon in order to hurt, hurt themselves or someone else. We've got to have background checks. I've been working on that for, ever since Ann Richards was governor. We've got to make certain we ban assault weapons. More importantly, we've got to elect a, a president that's sensitive to that issue and also the Second Amendment and also a Congress, which we already have, that's sensitive to the issue, but also a Senate that's sensitive to that issue. We know that the great majority of people in this country want to see some gun sense legislation. We have to elect persons that align with that particular Thank issue. Thank you very much. Mrs. Garcia, we'll give it to you now. In 2000, I was working for handgun control, and the talking points that we're using now are the same ones back then. We need to update our conversation about gun control, and we need to start prioritizing our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness over gun makers' profits, because that's what we're really talking about here. And I want to say that we can have a good conversation, a dignified conversation with gun owners about these things. I'm doing it in Mid Midland, Odessa on the 29th. I'm going to the largest um, uh, gun range in Texas. I did it a couple weeks ago. We sat down and we talked about issues of guns, and we can have conversations, but we don't have to water down our values in order to get what we need in order to reduce the, the gun violence in our country. Thank you very much. Mr. Cooper? Yes, uh, of course we need universal background check. But at the same time, uh, like uh, Texas Senator uh, uh, West said, is that we have to deal with the mental issues. Uh, and these are real issues. We can't just sweep them underneath <clears throat> the rug. Although everyone wants to do uh, buybacks and, and, and do all of the checks, we still need to go back and look at the, 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 the youth and how they've been treated, how they've been handled in high school, and we need to look at the background because most of these crimes are being committed by younger folks each and every day that are confused and have issues that has gone on with no attention, with little or no attention at all. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. It is now time for closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute to offer final thoughts for our viewers. Senator West, we'll begin with you. I'm asking persons to kind of look at my background. It's, a, it's frankly, I'm applying for a job that there's going to be a vacancy. Look at my background in terms of the experiences that I have. Look at the issues that I've addressed. I've addressed uh, gun issues. I've addressed health care issues. I've addressed uh, criminal justice issues and women's issues, as, as well as climate change and several other issues. If you want someone that's been able to do that, be able to work across the aisle, I'm the person that can get that done. Yes, I'm an experienced legislator, but the fact is, is that you need experience in order to make certain that we bring change to Texas. Thank you. Ms. Soon. I know how to build the winning coalition to defeat John Cornyn. The truth is none of us on this stage wins unless we drive up voter turnout. And no one knows how to do that better than me. I'm proud that I founded Jolt and ushered in a generation of young people into the political process. To have authored Beto's Senate campaign plan that led to a 250% <clears throat> increase in the Latino vote. And to also know how to harness the power of working moms like me across the state that want a better future for our kids. Now, I know in this race that people will say that my plans are too ambitious for Texas. But they will say that with the intention of scaring you away from what's possible. Because while John Cornyn may believe in the power of the ultra-wealthy and well-connected, I believe in the power of us. And I know that as Texans, we can dream big because we are big. Thank you. Mr. Osegueda. Yeah, I think in this campaign, we have to figure out what is a viable candidacy. And a lot of the reason why so many voters get distracted or not engaged in politics is because candidates stick to advocacy as opposed to dealing with concrete solutions. And I think the way that you win this election is actually by providing concrete solutions that people can actually stick their 
uh, teeth into and actually get a sense and a grasp of what those actual solutions are. In this campaign, I've talked about a Herthendahl Index for Wealth Inequality. I've talked about a 20% minority rule. I've talked to put some little bit of meat on the bone so that we can try actually shift the conversation towards actual solutions. I believe that if we try to do a polarized, take our unthinking herd to the polls to beat their unthinking herd to the polls, we lose. We have to provide voters with a little bit more in terms of solutions. And most people understand that our systems are breaking down. They understand that inequality is there. Our healthcare system, our, our educational systems are breaking down. What they actually want is a candidate that can actually bring some hardcore solutions to bear in this debate. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez. Well, I can tell you that I, I never thought in my life that I would be running for U.S. Senate twice in uh, my <laughs> lifetime. Being a daughter of immigrants and experiencing the most oppressive situations from being a, a young child experiencing the dumping of chemicals on top of us as we were picking tomatoes in the fields of Florida, I know what it's like to live that lifestyle. And I know the systems of oppression must come down. And that comes from someone who is willing to fight and tell the <clears throat> uncomfortable truths about our government, including holding those accountable within our own Democratic Party. And I know I am not politically connected. I cannot call on friends <clears throat> who uh, are in Hollywood or are on Wall Street to donate to our campaign. Our campaign is the only one that is not accepting money from billionaires. And our campaign is the only one who has been building a consistent following for the last four years, including building coalitions within the Poor People's Campaign and people across the, the state of Texas, with indigenous peoples on our side and people that are in marginalized communities and understanding the systemic problems in the system that must come down. Our campaign is the one that is set to win this nomination and defeat John Cornyn. Thank you. Mrs. Hagar. <clears throat> To the voters, I want to say that I have done three tours in Afghanistan as a rescue pilot, took on tough fights there, came home and took on the special interests in D.C. and was able to build a broad coalition of support. So I've taken on tough fights there, too, to make our military stronger. So I know I can be effective once I get there. To my kids at home, dude, I'm wearing your bracelet. You need to go to bed. I know you've heard a lot of scary things here tonight, but I'm here to tell you that even though you've also heard some sniping at mommy, Everybody here on this stage is going to fight to make sure that you have a bright future and a world you can live in and have educational opportunities. And to John Cornyn, because I know you're watching, I'm here to say, pack it up, Buttercup, because I'm coming for your seat and I'm going to take it back for the people of Texas. Thank you. Colonel Harris. You know what? I got to the game late. I was uh, occupied in Africa as U.S. Army Forces Commander in the Horn of Africa. But I'll tell you, if you go to my website, Everything we've talked about, I've got a detailed plan on how to solve it, um, victorfortexas.com. And um, I, I know what we need to get done, so I've written it down on paper so you can look at it. Those are my tasks to do when I get in office. I've got the qualifications, and I think everybody here knows I've got the most qualified resume, I've got the best ideas, and I've got the ability to beat John Cornyn. You all will know it, they'll know it, and John Cornyn will know it. So I ask you, don't, don't vote with your heart. Vote with your mind and understand who can really beat John Cornyn. And I'll tell you, I think that's me. So vote for Vic. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Garcia, final thoughts for our viewers. My name is Annie Mama Garcia. I'm a lawyer, a mother, and a healthcare nonprofit founder. Ich bin auch Geschäftsfrau. If you, if you uh, want to know what I just said, please go to johncornynsucks.com. Seriously. <clears throat> I am running because life is too hard, and I'm running because we are running out of time. If we continue to play politics as usual, John Cornyn is going to win yet again. We need to be different. We need to be the party that inspires people by having the moral clarity and the political bravery to do what is right. Texas has a chance to change the course of human history here, and that is why I'm running. I'm not going to tell you that I'm different. I'm going to show you that I'm different, and I'm doing that by walking 420 miles across the state of Texas. Te pido a votar. Te pido de votar para tu abuelita que te cuidaba y que sacrificaba tanto por ti, y estoy pidiendo que van a, a votar para tus hijos y su futuro. Que votar para la mamá harta con el corazón latino. Thank you very much. Mr. Foster, your closing statement. Yes. In the Bible, mm. Scripture states that God blesses his people so that they may bless those who have yet to be blessed. <clears throat> that means we must make a difference in people's lives. We mm. must go all out. We must incentivize taxpayers so that they may invest in people through my economic plan, my, <clears throat> and which uses public controlled capitalism and we create new workers, new taxes 
and a new life for everyone. Thank you very much. Ms. Edwards, your closing statement. I'm running to be your next United States Senator because Texans, all Texans deserve real results in their lives. The days have to come to an end where it's okay just to hear people making campaign promises only to have those promises <coughs> under delivered. We need effective servant leaders in office who know who the bosses are, which are the people, and of course who can deliver results. In order to get there, we have to pick someone out of the slate who can actually unseat John Cornyn. I am that candidate. What we learned from the 18th cycle is that we're going to need to pull upon <coughs> coalitions, very broad coalitions that include persuadable voters, people of color, and people under the age of 35. And if we can get all three of those coalitions to come together, we will have the votes necessarily to unseat, unnecessary to unseat John Cornyn and actually then deliver the results we describe. One of the things that's important to remember is that the power lies in the hands of the average ordinary <clears throat> American people. If we want to see change, we must invest in that change and that time is now. Thank you very much, Ms. Edwards. Mr. Cooper, we'll go to you for your closing statement. When I was in uh, Madam Morris yesterday walking around on the other side uh, of the border, I found my voice of uh, moral authority, and that voice is these <clears throat> folks are seeking education, health care, uh, better quality of life. These are not animals. These are not dogs. They were grooming themselves. They were bathing. <clears throat> they were feeding themselves. They were cutting each other's hair. This is what our society is made up of. should be a place where we have a chance, a choice to make a difference. I'm the difference maker on the outside. Automotive executive, pastor, psychologist. I've done it all for over 30 years, raised four children, three in college. I know about uh, health care and Medicare and all those reforms that we need. I know about uh, loan forgiveness for education. I have a son at 16, I wanted to take him out. But now at 26, he's going to be an educator, science teacher in Kansas uh, uh, State. So I'm excited about our future. I'm excited about being your next United States senator. My name is Michael Cooper. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for our final closing statement, Mr. Bell. I want to thank our hosts and I want to thank all of you for watching. Hopefully I've earned your support. And if you need more information, please visit electchrisbell.com. I've been in this fight for the Democratic Party for more than 30 years now. I served three terms as an at-large Houston City Council member, and I'm the only candidate on this stage who has actually served in the U.S. House of Representatives in the United States Congress and the only one who's run statewide. I have stood up for the disadvantage for working men and women for people with disabilities. I have spoken truth to power, and I assure you that when I am the Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate, I will be John Cornyn and Donald Trump's worst nightmare. <clears throat> Donald Trump is the dark underbelly of American politics. He is eating our souls as we watch with his corruption and divisiveness, and John Cornyn thinks that's just fine. Well, it isn't, and they must be stopped, and they will be stopped, because what they don't understand is that our souls aren't for sale. Thank are you, they? Mr. Bell. Well, I want to thank all of our candidates for participating in tonight's U.S. Senate Democratic primary debate brought to you by KVU News in partnership with KUT and the Texas Tribune. To our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in. If you missed any of tonight's debate, you can rewatch it on KVU.com and the KVU YouTube channel. Please don't forget to vote, Texas. Early voting started today and runs through Friday, February 28th. Election day is Tuesday, March 3rd, and the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you want more information on all of these candidates, head to KV.com. Vote, Texas. <laughs>